Hi there, welcome back to the breadboard. Today we have a mailbag, well, more than a mailbag, we're gonna do a review as well. But I received this package in the mail recently from a company called DFI, which is www.dfi.com if you wanna check them out for yourself. And what I have in here is a SBC, which could be termed as a small board computer or a single board computer that's only 1.8 inches in size, very comparable to a Raspberry Pi. Um, in fact, there's a Raspberry Pi. We'll be doing a comparison as we go along. Uh, it's got four gigs of RAM, the version I have. It's got dual HDMI 1.4 output that can go up to 4096 by 2160. Uh, it's got a mini PCIe, an SM bus. It's got a gigabyte ethernet. It's got a USB 3.1 Gen 2. Uh, that does not have the video capabilities on the USB 3.1. It has 32 gigs of eMMC storage. So anyway, without further ado, let's get this thing opened up um, onto the bench and have a look at the actual board. So this is what's in the box. We have a bunch of cables. Um, looks like a power adapter. Actually, let's get them out of the bag, shall we? So we have a power adapter from a standard barrel power connector to a pair of wires. That would be because the board, as we'll see, has screw terminals for its power. We have a host of other cables for setting up a reset and also bringing out some GPIO ports and things like that. This board does have GPIO, it's an industrial um, rated board for industrial applications. So we've got a red and a green LED and we've got these expansion headers and we've got a reset and another button. I guess we'll find out what that's for shortly. Um, we have a CD containing utilities. There's probably some drivers on here as well. We've got a demo on here. The board by the way is capable of running um, Linux as well as Windows. So that tells you a little bit more about the board as we go in. We have a quick reference guide, which I have a one on the computer, which I'll show you uh, better when we go through this. So there's that. Um, battery addendum, because there is a apparent, yes, there is a battery on the motherboard, probably for the real time clock. So what else do we have here? Uh, some standoffs. Probably going to need those for assembling the heatsink. We have a North American power cable. I'm sure that will change depending on what country you're ordering from. Let's just pull that out. We'll need that in a moment. We have a power supply. This is quite heavy and beefy. Wow, it is too. Uh, this is a 12 volt, 5 amp power supply. Uh, CE, FCC, uh, is it UL? Yep, UL. It's got all of the different ratings and everything else. That should be more than enough to drive this board. A little bit more than you need for a Raspberry Pi, that's for sure. Um, I mean, ignoring the processor board till last. We have a heat sink, heat spreader. Um, because of the power of this board, it's going to get pretty toasty when you're running it. So this is for industrial apps and they don't want to have too much noise. So we have a rather beefy heat spreader here, which is going to be going onto the board. A little bit of tape protecting the CPU uh, heatsink compound. And we've got another pad for, I guess, other components. And then we've got the spacing for putting it onto the board. We'll have a look at that shortly too. How to put that all together. Because I suspect you won't be able to power this up without the heatsink on, without risking it overheating. Oops. Hitting cameras. Let's move that out of the way. Okay, so here's the... Uh, main computer. So let's just pull this out and we will. Okay, so here is the board. We've got this little battery taped on. Um, just going to take that off for a second. That's the main CPU there on a rather large carrier board. You don't really want to be hitting that if we can help it. Just get this out of the way. I'm not going to unplug it because I'm not sure what they've got set in the uh, CMOS, so I'll just leave that there. So, what do we have on the top of the board to start with? We've got 
what looks like a couple of memory chips. These are K48G16s. I'll just bring those up on a data sheet so we can have a look. There we go. So these are Samsung 8 gigabit SD RAM. So they're basically half a gig by 16s, looks like. Um, 16 gigabits in total. And there are four of them on the board. So there's two here, one, two, and there's two on the back side, three, four. So that makes up our four gigabytes of RAM. So these are the two HDMI 1.4 ports. Okay micro HDMI looks like we have some power supply type of components here scattered around lots of decoupling and everything else we have our USB-C 3.1 gen 2 port so that should give us some very high speed IO to any computer that it might attach to or peripheral which is using that kind of speeds we have our gigabit Ethernet port here we have a PC mini PCI Express port, which you'd be able to put a Wi-Fi adapter in or um, more memory, um, like flash or something like that as a second drive. Here's our power input, plus and minus. It's 12 volts. Uh, we have a GPIO kind of port. Okay, running through the board on the back side, we have our second two RAM DDR4 chip. Um, the large chip on here is the 32 gig SanDisk EMMC flash and the smaller chip is an Ethernet controller 1211AT. Um, so that completes, oh we got two more headers here for I.O. There, there's um, SM bus connection on here as well as general P GPIO. So I think the other one on here is going to be for the uh, reset button and things like that. But anyway that's the quick walk over the board as you can see if I grab a Raspberry Pi 4 um, I know this is in a case but if I just sit this over that you can see it is actually physically slightly smaller than a Raspberry Pi 4 but what we have in here if I bring up the data sheet now so we can see CPU specifications and things like that. So this is the data sheet for the board. So the specifications of what we have in here, I'm just going to zoom in on this a little bit. Uh, you can get a number of different versions of this board. And the one I have is populated with the Ryzen R1606G, which is a dual core with hyperthreading. Uh, if that's the right term for an AMD processor. Uh, one meg of cache has got three CUDA units in it and it will run at stock at 2.6 gigahertz with a boost up to 3.5 gigahertz and a 12 watt um, power rating. So that's not too bad. That's a lot of power for 12 watts, a lot of horsepower. These are also slower versions. So you've got 2.6 gig stock, 2.4 gig and then we're going down to 1.5 gig and 1.2. Now obviously these uh, slower processors, if you don't need the speed, then they're going to be much better for low power applications. Uh, we've got our DDA, DDR4 memory. I've got 4 gig installed in this, although you can get versions with 8 gig for the applications that need it. And these are DDR4 2400 speed memory. Our BIOS is contained in a 64 megabit, so that's 2 megabyte AMI SPI chip. That's going to be under that little plastic cover I showed you. Um, that would be right here. So it looks like they have one that they can just drop in and plug in. Makes it easier, I guess. Graphics controller. So we've got an AMD Radeon Vega GPU with three computing units in it. I said CUDA before, but it's computing units. Um, H.265 decode and encoding support built right in. That might actually be handy. Uh, we've got two, the two micro HDMIs, full-size PCI, mini PCI Express. Uh, I will try putting in a Wi-Fi card in there. Um, we've got the Ethernet controller, one gig. Uh, looks like you can get two Ethernet controllers on here on request. Although, looking at the board, I can't see where it would go 
to be honest. There's no space on this board that I have. Maybe they have a slightly different version of a board, or it stacks perhaps. So scrolling down a little bit, what else have we got on the board here? We've got our 8-bit DIO, we're going to have to figure out how to use that. Um, an SM bus, which is an industrial version of I2C basically. Um, I will try and hook up a, um, a couple of I2C different devices onto that to see if, how well it works. We have the 32 gigabytes of eMMC. You can get 64 gig if you need it. Um, Windows IoT, uh, I'm not sure if it's server or not, but the Windows version that's on here for SBCs will fit quite happily within, I think, 12 gigs. So that gives us about 10 gigs, 20 gigs free for application space. We've got our watchdog timer built in. Where, and you can program it via software from 1 to 65,535 seconds. Uh, nice. Uh, TPM module built in. Uh, 12 volts plus or minus 5%. Power consumption typically 0.37 amps up to 1.74 amps. I guess it depends on how much you load it. We've got a CR2032 coin cell. That's a standard 3 volt lithium coin cell. Um, support has got EUFI sorry, UEFI built in. That's the only thing it supports, but it can run Windows 10 IoT Enterprise, which I believe the folks at DFI um, sent to me pre-installed on here. And it can run Linux version 5.3 kernel. I'm, assume, I'm hoping that that may be on the disk. Now, I may not overwrite the Windows if I can't back it up so that I can restore it again afterwards. Zero to 60 degrees C, operating or my so that's minus 20 to plus 70 storage minus 40 to plus 85 50 to 90 percent relative humidity and a 1.8 inch form factor so some pretty impressive specifications there for such a small board and you can see why now it needs this honking big heat sink to keep everything cool Okay, so here we've got the board layout again, only this time it's just a pictorial view. So we've got the Ethernet controller, we've got the flash front panel connections, SM bus for other devices like a temperature sensor, uh, things like that. We've got our AMD Ryzen, that's the biggest chip on the board. A uh, little buzzer, <laughs> okay, didn't notice that. Yep, there's a little buzzer on there, okay. And the bottom view, two HDMI ports, a little UART debug port, we'll have to hook that up to something. Um, our battery for retaining the real-time clock and things, I'd imagine. Our DIO connector, and they did provide a cable for that, so we'll have to see if I can... Oh, that's nice. They've... Um, let me just change view here so you can see. Right. So on the DIO cable, if, uh, these are the ones, this is the end that plugs into the board. All right, so here's our six pin, six pin. That's a larger six pin. And where's the other one? Oh, here. There's the 10 pin for the DIO connector, which is over here, right here. So that'll plug in here. And on the other end, they have some standard 0.1 inch pitch connectors so that we can easily use um, flying leads, you know, plug sockets and things onto a breadboard or something like that quite easily. So that's nice of them to do that. This came with the motherboard. So that's good. Not sure what the second button is for yet. One's probably a, well, one is definitely going to be for a reset. Oh, the other one, probably power on off. There you go. Sorry, completely forgot about that. And I guess you need a storage device if you're going to be booting off of it. External system peripherals may also be required for navigation and display, including at least a mouse, a keyboard, and a display monitor. That's a good point. That's all going to have to be plugged into the USB-C port, I would think. Hmm. There is no standard USB output on this. I don't know if they would have had remote takeover enabled automatically. So that will be curious. Yeah, I'm going to need a USB-C to regular USB cable. So the one thing it didn't say up top that you probably should do right off the bat is install the heat spreader. I'm not sure how much it would tolerate running without it. 
So I'm not going to waste time trying to figure that uh, trying to run it without the heat spreader on. I'm just going to put that on right away. So here's the board, here's the heat spreader. Um, here are our screws and some standoffs. So let's get this done. It's going to be pretty straightforward, I would say. This is probably going to be interfacing with these on the RAM. And this obviously on the main CPU there. I'm not touching it. I'm just close to it, but not touching it. And obviously this cutout here is so that you can still get to these connectors at the end. So it's pretty obvious which way around this is going to go. So let's take off that protective tape and get this put on here. So that's going to just sit right on there. Okay, we're going to need these screws to come up from the underside through the heatsink out of here. And then we can attach, I think, the... Yeah, because these standoffs are not going to go that way. They're going to be facing that way. There is nothing to go on top here right now, but I guess if you're putting it into a case, that would allow you to screw it into a case. So anyway, without further ado, let's get these screws in. Oh, that little screw, they're off screen. This little screw here, that's going to be for the PCIe board if you put one on. So let's just hold this, turn it over. Okay, so we're all assembled. I'm just going to temporarily put this screw here into the PCIe slot. Just looking at this, I'm not sure if my um, Wi-Fi modules are actually going to fit. One second. So, I would say they won't because they're rather short. I'll have to, if I'm going to use one of these, I'll need to 3D print. I've done it before. Um, there's actually some 3D printable little boards that you can put on here that are on Thingiverse so that you can actually extend out the side for attaching smaller boards like this Wi-Fi module. So now that we're all hooked up, um, let's get the power connected. It would probably be a mistake to assume that the Black wire is ground, although it will be a fair guess that it is. Let's just get the power supply hooked up and just measure where the plus is. Should be 12 volts. And it is. Let's just plug this in and measure the volts on the end here. Yes, the yellow is the positive. Excellent. So we'll just unplug that again a second. Yellow is positive, so it's actually marked on the end here, positive, negative. All right, there's plus and minus hooked up, so there's our power connection right here. Not going to hook the power up to it yet because I want to have a screen connected as well when we do that. Okay, so here is the power reset and Yes, running one's probably going to be power, one's going to be disk activity, I would guess. Um, lights, these have to go onto one of the headers on the other side of the board. So that's going to be one of these two right in here. Let me just find the bit in the manual. Okay, with the board orientated in this direction, it is the one that is nearest to me. The one above is the SM bus, so the one at the bottom is the front panel, which would be this one. Now they've marked the pin 1 with a little white dot, and on the board, pin 1 is the bottom right. It shows it in the screen capture here with a pin missing, but it's not on the board, it's actually there. But the thing is, you need to just make sure you get the right it the right way around, otherwise you could short something out. So, let's put that in. 
I'm doing this off camera because they're very thin pins and I need to see what I'm doing. Okay, that's everything assembled. Um, got my GPIO leads. I think they've broken out the 5 volts into this separate one and then there's the GPIO. We have our power connection. We've got our battery already in. We have our power and our reset buttons. This one is our SM bus or I2C to us normal hobbyists. And we've got our power and activity LEDs hooked up there that you would normally put into a front panel as well. I don't have a box for this yet or anything like that. That might be something I might design and 3D print in a, another video at some point. For now it's going to run like this on the bench. I might have to turn it over and let the heat out. Depends how warm it gets. Um, but that's ready to power up except the fact that I need a uh, network connection. I also need a keyboard connected and maybe a mouse would be nice. So let me just go and find all those bits and I'll be right back. Okay, after a bit of faffing around, I've discovered that I'm not able to um, capture using my Blackmagic capture card for the output of the HDMI from this for some reason. Not 100% sure what resolution it's trying to run at. But in order to get this initial overview done, I've plugged in an external a portable screen to it. It's actually connected via the HDMI out, but I've also connected the USB-C to it um, because the screen has a touch capability. So I should be able to, theoretically, because it's pre-installed with Windows, uh, be able to use the touch capability for configuration in lieu of attaching a keyboard and everything. Um, the one, I don't know if you'd call it a downside, um, it kind of is, but it isn't. It's just the state of the way things are going. There are no USB type A or B or even USB 3 ports on this computer. The only USB we have in its entirety is a USB C. And I did not have anything that would allow me to plug in a keyboard because there's no Wi Fi or Bluetooth on here that I could connect one of those kind of devices. Uh, and I'd have to be able to configure it anyway, so there's a chicken and egg situation. There's only the USB-C. So, um, I'm hoping that the touch capability should fire up automatically. But in the meantime, I did pop out and buy a um, USB-C hub. So, I guess the next thing to do is to switch to the screen view. And I'll power it up. So, let's switch over now. Okay, this is the screen now. Uh, sorry, a fraction of the camera and the green screen behind me, but should clear up a little bit once it's powered up. So let's power this up. Okay, that's the Mage Dock screen coming up. The uh, computer is booting up now. The green LED is on. Got our typical little cursor in the corner. Get five beeps for some reason from this. I haven't been able to find any documentation that describes the beep codes. So I will send um, DFI an email asking if they have any documentation for the beep codes. None of the provided PDFs had any mention of them. That was the Amy BIOS that we just saw pop by there. And any minute now we should get the Windows starting logos if everything's working according to plan. Just going to try plugging this into the other HDMI port. I mean it should work on this one because it's not um, Ah, yeah, it seemed to come up on the one that was not connected. Okay, that is HDMI 1 that it came up on. Uh, maybe the um, BIOS configuration isn't set to mirroring both ports or something like that. Now, hopefully... Oh, there we go. So now we have the touchscreen working. Pick Chinese or whatever. I'm not sure if that's Chinese. I think that's Korean, Chinese, French, Dutch, English. We want English. So now let's just walk, walk through this. We should be able to just configure this. This is Windows 10 Enterprise, IoT Enterprise Edition, I believe. So let's just go next. Sorry about all the reflections. It's the best I can do with, because I can't capture this directly. So United States, let's start with what region? We're in Canada, actually. So I could say United States, but let's put it in correctly. Canada. There we go. Pick Canada. Next. Keyboard layout, well, if I did plug a keyboard in, it's going to be US layout, so we'll just say yes. Want to add a second keyboard layout? No, so we'll just say skip. 
Just going to turn my head off because I think I'm blocking some of the view there. There we go. So obviously they haven't done a full um, completed install, which is a good thing because you normally wouldn't want it to be installed. You want to be able to let the users make their choices as far as how they configure this, what kind of keyboard they may use, etc., etc. Like I said, I'm using Touch right now to see how well that goes. Uh, license agreement, well, we don't have to read it. We're going to... If we want to use it, we've got to accept it, right? Okay, sign in with Microsoft. Yeah, we'll do a local one. So we'll just put in Peter. I've got a lot of keyboards around me. I keep going to grab a keyboard, forgetting that I'm um, running on a touch screen here. Okay, you've got to put in a password. For now, I'm just going to put in password. I have a lot of lights on for the videoing, so there's not really a good angle with this uh, very shiny MageDoc screen. I wish they had a matte version, um, but this is what they sent me when I did a review on this way back. Very useful for things like this, but it is shiny, which makes it annoying a little bit. Just as a casual note, while we're waiting on this doing its thing, if I zoom out a little bit, um, the MageDoc has USB-C, it has the HDMI in, it will actually support full video over its HDMI C port into the MageDoc. Um, the computer here that we're reviewing does not support video out of the USB C port, the GHF51, but um, it does obviously have the, the data ports going in there, so it supports the touchscreen and everything. But the MageDoc is actually being fully powered by the GHF51. So obviously the design of the GHF51 USB-C port is conforming to the power requirements for USB-C as opposed to being just a mechanical equivalent to USB-C with just really USB 3 or 2 capabilities. It's supplying enough current to drive this display, which is nice to know that you can do that. So you just have one power connection into the computer and then you can drive um, full USB-C type devices out of that port. Later on, I'm going to put a hub in there and we'll put in a um, external hard drive, probably an SSD, as well as the MageDoc screen and um, maybe a wireless keyboard and things. We'll just load it up a little bit just to do some more experimenting. For now, we're just going to go through this and it looks like we are in. The question is, am I connected to the internet? Well, it is connected to the internet. Um, you know what, I'm just going to say download that, we'll give it a shot, why not? Oh, that's in an Explorer, the new version of Edge coming in and annoying everything. Okay. Okay, looks like we're all installed and happy now. I've just set it doing an update on any drivers, it's doing that in the background. In the meanwhile, I've brought up the uh, Windows properties just so we can see what it thinks we have. So we have installed here Windows 10 Enterprise LTSC edition. Um, I don't have a license key for it, so it's saying that it's not activated at this point in time. Um, so it'll, but it's still going to run 15 days even without that, or 90 days I think. And um, don't need that activated for running a review. Everything's still going to work just fine and you know it won't stop us putting Linux on maybe later on and things like that too. So anyway, what do we have here? We've got the AMD Ryzen embedded R1606G with the Radeon Vega GFX running at, and the whole thing's running at 2.6 gigs which is the fastest processor. Uh, we've got 4 gigs of RAM installed. We've got a 64-bit operating system. We've got touch enabled because I have it plugged into a touch screen, which is rather cool. Um, computer names, just random one generated at startup. So I haven't added it to any domains or anything like that at this point, And I haven't activated it. Um, device manager, let's see what we find inside. So audio, we've got an High definition audio, which is actually built into the monitor here that it's seeing. This is the AMD high definition audio, so it's feeding audio out of the HDMI port by the look of it. 
Uh, I don't have anything. Uh, actually, I could probably go to YouTube and play one of my videos or something to test on that. 64-bit uh, processor. Uh, disk drives. It's going to think it's got, yeah, it's got the SanDisk 32 gig uh, EMMC. Display adapters, AMD Radeon Vega 3 graphics. Firmware. Uh, USB input devices. Standard SATA AHCI controller. Uh, that says Jungo connectivity. Never heard of that before now. Monitors, generic plug and play, network adapters. A whole host of them. So we have primarily the i211 uh, gigabit network connection, which is an Intel chip. So I don't think it's using the Ethernet that's built into the Ryzen processor. I think it's actually got three, I think. Let's check the specs. Um, anyway, uh, processor, we should have four cores there. Well, it's two cores with hyper-threading. AMD SD host controller. Should have a um, trusted platform device in the AMD PSP1, uh, sorry, 10.0. Uh, software components, version control, software devices, so that's audio, looks like a wavetable synthesizer, etc. Uh, AMD high definition audio device, and that's feeding out of the HDMI right now. I don't, there isn't an actual audio jack or anything on the board, so it does rely on the HDMI, I think, at the moment. Uh, storage controllers, Microsoft Storage Spaces controller, and you've got the SD class storage controller because the uh, flash is a SanDisk flash, so it probably sees it as an SD device. Uh, lots of system devices, and of course the USB, which is seeing a USB 3.1 extensible host controller, which is excellent. That's what we should be seeing. So that's everything connected. That doesn't give us an idea of performance or anything right now. Um, what I might do now then is just um, look for, a, think of a couple of suitable applications to load up on here. We don't have a huge amount of space. If I open up the hard drive, um, you can see here we've already used um, 9.4 gigs of 28 gigs. We've only got nine. We just got a, just under 10 gigs of free space, so we can't load any massive applications on here. But it's not meant as a um, desktop replacement. This is an industrial PC, so you'd be running it more as a gateway or as a controller and things like that. So we probably, or well, I will probably find some applications that are more suitable to that. One of the things I may try sooner than later is actually running um, Blue Iris, which is quite CPU intensive um, security monitoring application. It would need to have an external hard drive for putting any video on, but even just processing the video and everything else. Well, I'm running it on a uh, an older HP AMD based machine right now, and it's pretty much CPU bound um, with six cameras. So it'd be interesting to see what this would do with the same load. Okay, I've tried a few applications with the Windows install of the GHF51, and what I'm finding is it's got very little left because of the configuration of this particular model that I have on the bench. Yes, it does work, and yes, you can load up a few things, but it does get bogged down a little bit if you have any heavier duty applications. I tried to load Blue Iris on it and it was basically pegged all the time because that's a very CPU intensive application with all the video streams and transcoding and things like that. And really this is not designed for that kind of thing anyway. Um, but being Windows 10, I wanted to give it a try and it loaded okay and it runs okay, but it's not an ideal uh, application for this. So what I thought I would do is load up Ubuntu um, Revision 20.2, I think it is, 
Um, I won't show you the actual install process here because I just followed the exact instructions from the Ubuntu website. Uh, I had to update the BIOS on the GHF 51 first, and there's instructions on the website for that. Uh, very, very straightforward. And then everything else was a standard Ubuntu install. You do need to use Rufus, which is one of the um, CD-ROM slash SD card ISO to those devices kind of burning tool. And you select MP, uh, and you select MBR, Master Boot Record Format for the drive. And then it would boot up no problem as a USB disk or a CD-ROM or whatever. Um, and go into the installation process, which didn't take long. I didn't have to load any special drivers or anything like that to make it all work. And um, yeah, it just went in, no problems at all. Now, with Ubuntu in here, uh, and it is the very latest version, it is running very well. Um, I've got a bunch of different applications installed, uh, Node-RED, uh, as well for like an industrial control situation and things. Haven't tried any of the GPIO uh, applications and things like that yet that would use these I.O. connectors that are included with the kit. I do want to do that, but I'm just not going to do it in this video. So let's just flip over to the Ubuntu screen. Um, one of the things you'll see is that it is actually working um, in the I can capture the screen as well. So here we are, um, it's idle timed out, so I would just go back in again. And you can see here that we indeed do have an Ubuntu screen. I am screen capturing it, so it works quite well. I'm able to, I'm looking off to the side because I've got a, a bigger screen than trying to watch the small one on my uh, screen capture system. So, um, you know, we've got, as I said, we've got Node-RED running, we've got Firefox, which can bring up and we'll just bring that up right now. Comes up fairly quickly. Uh, let's go to a YouTube maybe. All right, so yeah, we'll not go there. Let's just go to my own channel. Breadboard.ca. There we go. And we can look at, you know, just to try it, we'll play one of my other videos. So what you're listening to there is just the video I'm playing and the speakers are just what's built into a little 12 inch um, portable monitor. So it's not terribly high quality speakers, but you can see playing this quite well. I bump it up to a 1080p resolution. Yeah, it seems to be doing pretty good. Just get out of that. Close that off. So that's running Firefox. I haven't tried a huge amount of things because this is about looking at the GHF 51, not about how well Firefox and other things work with YouTube. And uh, just close all that. So I installed Node-RED. Now with Ubuntu, you can use their um, Snap installer, which comes pre-installed with it, um, or you can load directly. And what I found with Node-RED was I loaded it with Snap and then it wouldn't let me install um, a bunch of other applications, uh, you know, modules within Node-RED, like the Modbus module. It kept saying I didn't have permission and apparently Snap with Node-RED and things really, really tightly locks it down. So it's problematic when you want to add extra modules. So what I did was I removed Snap and simply used apt-get install and then npm install etc to get Node-RED in. I created a Pi user just so that I can use the uh, standard uh, Raspberry Pi type scripts that are available online for starting and stopping the Node-RED service and then that just worked perfectly well. So if I just bring up the Node-RED interface uh, no, I can't do that. That's not no point in that because it's already running. 
Let's bring up the uh, browser again. Okay, so with Node Red installed, you should be able to just go to the IP address of your Node Red install and go to port 1880. That's the default, and you should be able to get in. I haven't set up any security on it particularly right now. So um, I'm on IP address 160 on my local network. So HTTP colon slash slash 192.168.1.160 colon 1880 should get me into Node Red. There we go. So response is not too bad at all. Let's just make this full screen. There we go. So you can see I already tried loading in a couple of modules. So there's Modbus. Uh, I'm going to do some future playing around with that. We've also got the latest dashboard all loaded up. Uh, big timer from my friend in England. Um, and things. But just to show you how easy and it, the fact that it doesn't give me any errors anymore is I'll go to Palette Manager and Install and we'll go uh, let's sort of think what are we going to put in here. Let's put in, uh, I don't know, SQL Lite um, interface. So there we go, right there. We'll just hit install and agree to that. And it should just go in without an issue. Just give it a moment to go chug, chug, chug. I'm going to do a separate video on using this with Node Red and also seeing if I can get these interfaces on the device uh, just flip to the other screen uh, so we've got 10 io ports here and we've got an i2c so i'm going to see if i can get any of that working but right now uh, i haven't i'm not doing that in this video i just wanted to see how much better and how much quicker things respond with ubuntu and this is the latest version of Ubuntu, uh, running on here. And it seems to be like it's a completely different computer. I'm really impressed with how well this is working. Um, the computer itself, the GHF51, does get warm. So I'd say if you're going to put it into an enclosure, you would need to have it um, with some airflow. So either mount it with the fins vertically with vents in the case, or have a fan blowing through or something like that. Um, but this is kind of get to the end of this um, actual review of the product right now. And I'm quite happy with what I'm seeing. And I would say definitely that if you're going to get the version with the smaller RAM configuration to save some money, I wouldn't try to run Windows on it. Um, with only having 32 gig of EEMC flash, you do run out of uh, program space very, very quickly to store your programs and applications if you're loading up. Um, I would say don't try and use it as a desktop. You know, it really is not designed for that, especially not with Windows. Um, with Ubuntu loaded, though, you can run... Uh, actually, they actually come installed on here, so why don't I just try and show you that. Um, Lubre Office and things like that. So let's bring up a word processor, shall we? To see how quickly it comes up and things like that. Um, there it is, LibreOffice Writer. So just clicked, and there it is, up already. Let's just say OK to that, and blah de blah de blah de blah de blah. So that's form. Now when I look at the menus and how quickly they're popping up when I'm scrolling over them, it is perfectly responsive and everything else. So uh, under an Ubuntu, I would say this is definitely a winner. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to clarify that because uh, all my playing up to now had been with the Windows 10 uh, Industrial. And I really wanted to give this a fair crack at showing off what it can do from a performance perspective with an application so you know having a linux in here the ubuntu style which is the one that's supported um made it completely change and it became very very responsive uh loads of space on the hard drive loads of space in ram 
and um, now I'm going to try and do a few other things with it in future videos so that we can have uh, a bit more information about how well we can use the I.O. Um, even as a gateway product or something like that, um, it will work very, very well because it's got a high perf performance processor in here. It was just limited by how much EMMC and RAM that's on the unit. Uh, so I look forward to potentially in the future maybe getting a version of this with uh, more EMMC and maybe more RAM as well, certainly more EMMC so that Windows will have a better time because, you know, when Windows runs out of hard drive space, it starts to crawl because it's trying to swap and things like that. Um, Ubuntu here, no issues whatsoever. Let's just close this off a second. So, yes, and I'm running this in dual screen mode right now. Um, and I've, so I've got a screen to my left here. That's that way, because I'm mirrored. <laughs> and which is a 1080p screen. And I've also got it plugged into my capture card, which is what you're seeing. And I told it to mirror the screens. You can run them as side-by-side -side screens and things like that too, if you want. Under Windows, it was a little problematic in that uh, it would never necessarily come up on the same screen twice. Uh, but under Ubuntu, it is working much, much better. Now, that may be a BIOS fix later on or a Windows driver fix later on or something. I don't know. Um, but as I said, under Ubuntu, it seems to be working perfectly well. And I, uh, under Windows, I wasn't even able to capture any screens. Um, under Ubuntu, it seems to be working better. I probably will do some more investigation in that in the future. But for now, um, I think that pretty much completes looking at the GHF51 from DFI. And um, yeah, it's not the cheapest single board computer. You can get things like a Raspberry Pi 4 um, for less money. But the Raspberry Pi 4 is not industrial certified. This is certified. It comes with the great big heat sink. Let me just flip back to the view so I can point while we're talking. There we go. So it comes with a great big heat sink. Um, everything is certified for industrial temperature range versus just a normal office kind of inst uh, installation. Uh, I think the only part that I would say is, I won't say wrong, but um, Odd is that these standoffs that come with it to mount it onto something don't leave any room for mounting it. Things like the um, Ethernet connector is actually sticking proud of these screws. So these screws should, re the standoff should really be longer um, than there's not long enough in this application. It would have been nice to have uh, Wi Fi on board, but it doesn't. But as you can see here, I simply added a PCI Express um, mini board, just a small one here, and that picked up and I'm running dual antennas, 5 gig and 2.4 gig, and it's working perfectly well. It picked it up immediately and it works great. So I'll provide a link to the Wi-Fi adapter that I used on this as well. It also includes, by the way, uh, Bluetooth on that adapter too. And it wasn't very expensive. So, um, yeah, I look forward to trying this. I, th I may choose to make this the hub of my home computer system, move my uh, Node-RED and MQTT and things onto here because it does have a more powerful processor and everything else for doing all that. Um, or I may use it for some other applications. haven't decided yet, but I will be using it. It works quite nicely, and I'm very happy with it. Um, your mileage may differ depending on your applications, but certainly it's worth having a look at. Home automation and things like that is my game, so uh, if it's your game too, then it would be worth at least uh, looking up the single board computer and going over its specs and see if it would fit what you want to do. Um, even in some you know, office and small industrial applications, it would definitely be worth looking at. As I said, some very minor things I think would be that these aren't standard 0.1 inch pitch connectors. Uh, so I can't just take some um, 3M or connectors or anything like that and just plug them in to try things out. I'm going to have to find some adapters for these. Um, 
and I guess the hard drive led uh, does not work on this particular module for some reason either. Um, apparently some kind of PCB. Now maybe that's a PCB issue. Maybe they fix that in a future revision of the motherboard. I don't know, but for now on mine, the hard drive activity led is not working, so it's difficult to tell um, if it's busy doing anything. Uh, that being said, I've had this running now for, I had it running for quite a while under Windows. Um, not really doing a whole bunch because it didn't have the space for it, but uh, it didn't crash and didn't have any issues at all. Uh, I'll come back to it a couple of days later. Uh, that's hence this bit with Ubuntu. I've got a different top line, probably had a haircut uh, because there's a little bit of time lapse between when I recorded the first part of the video to now. Um, and under Ubuntu, I've now had it running for a couple of, or a few weeks just to let it sit and soak and see how stable it was. And um, Node Red and everything else that I've tried has just come up every time I've rebooted. If I've left it alone, the screens and everything else will go into standby mode, but Node Red and everything else kept going. Never had it crash once under Ubuntu. And as I said, this is the latest one. If you look in the uh, GHF 51 manual and uh, forums, it talks about Ubuntu 18 point something. Um, I figured, you know, what the heck, let's just try the latest one. And it seems to be working just fine. Uh, I may run into some issues if I try their applications in a little while uh, for testing GPIO and things like that. But uh, you'll find out in those videos. But for now, as far as using it as a computer with networking and everything else, it's working just fine. So I'm happy with that. And I think you would be too. So that's it for now. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, well then don't. But uh, see you in the next video.